great to be with you this morning, and uh, we trust that Pastor Norb and the young people had a had a wonderful weekend together. I remember years and years of um, doing youth retreats, and those are powerful times, just powerful times that uh, make a huge impact in the lives of the young people. And so, if um, if you don't know um, who I am, my name is Pat Summers, and I am one of your missionaries. And uh, it's a privilege to serve you as one of your missionaries. And, and I um, want to just give you a little bit of an update this morning. Um, I didn't bring pictures today. The nature of some of the missions that we do, as some of you know, is um, we, we have to be careful. But, uh, so I'm just going to give you a general update of some of the neat things that God's doing through Think Missions. That's our mission agency, and we, um, we work in, in quite a few places in the world, but we found ourselves drilling deep in four primary areas over the last several years, and, and uh, that's in Cuba, that's in Bolivia, that's in Pakistan, and that's in northern India. And just recently, actually as of this week, as of Monday of this week, uh, we just expanded our ministry into Nepal. And um, what has happened is our Bible school uh, in northern India, uh, where, of course, there was, you know, 0.01% Christians. So statistically, there, there aren't any believers there, and that's why we're there. That's um, what we focus on is unreached and underreached areas of the world. Um, but because of the pandemic, things have been shut down. And uh, even public schools still are shut down there, even right now. And so our Bible school, our fall session of our Bible school, because when we went there, we, we, we're a church planning organization. And so that's what we work on is starting new churches in needy parts of the world. And we didn't have pastors to do that. And so we had to take a step back and, and build a Bible school and start an educational program to raise up pastors. And uh, so that was canceled in the fall because of the pandemic. But we have a new relationship and we're able to start a brand new residential Bible school in Nepal. Uh, just started, opened up Monday. It'll just be a one month uh, intensive church planner training uh, program. We have 27 students uh, in that Bible school and are anticipating uh, some future church planners to be a result of that. We also started our, um, our six-month residential human trafficking program. Uh, and the way it works with our Bible schools in the fall is we raise up uh, students and pastors uh, from January to June, uh, especially now we started this last year because of the pandemic, uh, the human trafficking has just become atrocious. Uh, poverty is so bad that, you know, of course, they're, they're saying, hey, we have jobs for you in the cities and housekeeping jobs and so forth, and they get them into sex trafficking and so forth. So we opened up our Bible school to a residential program. We've hired teachers. And right now, uh, as of just a few weeks ago, we have 20 girls in our six-month residential program. 20 girls that their lives are going to be changed. I mean, the trajectory of their lives. I can guarantee you, after spending six months with our leaders in a Christian environment, exposed to Bible studies. In fact, our leaders just purchased Bibles for each of them. A couple of weeks ago, they have their own Bible. And of course, you know, these girls are coming out of false religion and, and uh, very difficult circumstances. So a lot of healing. And, and then we're also training them in uh, different vocations. Uh, so that they, when they leave the program, they're going to have skills, uh, computer skills. They're going to have beautician skills and uh, sewing skills. And I just got a text the other day of some little baby and little girl dresses that our students are, you know, the girls there have uh, sewn and, and the skills that they're developing. And so it's giving them meaningful, purposeful work as well as, of course, the internal heart changes that are taking place. And we're also very excited because, again, we're a church planting mission, and we just had a piece of property donated to us in northern India from a widow lady and her son. And they believe in what, what's going on and getting wind of what God's beginning to do in a very difficult area. 
and they donated property. So we're going to be working hard to get a church built on that property, get one of our pastors uh, in there to start a work in an unreached area. Also, uh, many of you know, because you guys have been involved in the past and have helped plant churches in Cuba, um, it's been very difficult for us during the last couple of years to, to do ministry there with the pandemic, the restrictions and the travel restrictions. But the good news is we have a team scheduled to get back in in May. This May, we're looking to send our first team back after, uh, it's been actually two years now since we, we just have been prohibited. And then also in uh, Bolivia, we, we work in areas where there are unreached people and uh, we have a team scheduled for July. So thank the Lord we're able to not only continue to do our work remotely and feed people and do food outreaches and continue to plant churches and see people come to Christ, but we're going to be able to mobilize and, and get, get teams back on the field here now. And we are grateful to the Lord for that. So that's just a quick update just to give you guys a uh, to let you know what's going on and to thank you for your partnership with Think Missions and uh, because you're a part of this. Uh, all of that report through your prayers and your financial support, you guys are a part of that. And, you know, I often think about these churches that are getting planted and, and so forth. I was just talking to a pastor this past week and I said, won't it be cool that, you know, after we're gone, God calls us home and uh, we are with him enjoying heaven to be able to, to help welcome some of the people who came to Christ through these mission investments into their eternal reward. And I think those kinds of thoughts. And, and in fact, this morning, let me just kind of um, share some things that have been going on in my heart. I, I, I think a lot about missions and um, not just because it's my job, but just because I'm a Christian, you know, and I, I, I try to, I, I wonder why sometimes it seems like it's difficult for us um, to stay motivated when it comes to, you know, evangelism and missions and and uh, so th these are a few things I just want to share with you. I didn't bring a PowerPoint this morning. I'm not going to walk you through a, a three-point sermon. Uh, I want to be a little more informal and share some scripture and some thoughts that maybe can challenge us and also encourage us. And so, Father, thank you for this time. And, Lord, we just ask for you to smile on us right now as we gather around your word, as we... Um, Take time to worship you because you are worthy. Where would we be without Jesus? And uh, we're so grateful for this opportunity. And any time that the saints come together, we know that, that you're here with us in a special way. And so Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts and enlarge our hearts this morning, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. When we think about um, mission and evangelism and things, I know that the, the first and, and most obvious um, hindrance is that we have to recognize it's a spiritual battle. And any time that we are going to purposely engage in trying to share our faith with someone and try to help them to to start to think about their eternal state and, and, and the fact that we need a savior, that gets the enemy's attention. And, and so we are going to confront a, a living, a real enemy who is, is very purposely trying to prohibit us and prohibit God's kingdom from expanding. And, but correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like we associate missional outreach primarily as a, as a church program. Uh, it, it tends to be viewed as more corporate than individual. And I, I believe the Lord wants us to understand that mission isn't something that we do. It, it's, it's who we are. And, and there's a difference. It's not a program. It, it's just an overflow, a natural, systemic overflow from a regenerate heart. That's 
the biblical view here. The church, when we read in the scripture, it's not an organization. The Bible says that we are an organism. See, the Bible says that we're the living, breathing body of Christ and he is the head. It's his church. It's his mission. And I, I think sometimes we forget this. We, we forget that as believers that uh, we are each are a part of the body of Christ and we have the privilege of participating uh, as his body and, you know, being his eyes that see a need, being his mouth that can speak to a need, being his feet that can walk to a need, his hands that can touch and, and embrace and, and work to meet needs that are close to his heart, that are breaking his heart as it bleeds for the lost and dying of the world. And, and so I don't think missions is an organizational or a program issue as much as it's a heart issue. Actually, just like everything else. And that's why Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 tells us very clearly, exhorts us, above all else, above all else, I mean we need to pay attention, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. And so I just simply want to remind us this morning, remind myself this morning, it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And how can we... Allow the Lord to impassion our hearts, to, to help us to learn to live more fully from our hearts. So I, I want your vision of God to be enlarged so you can see him and his purposes for your life and, and see that more clearly. And when that happens, something happens, our, our heart beats faster. And, and when your heart beats fast about God and his purposes, now you have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Every day becomes an adventure. Now uh, we, we start to live with purpose and understand that we have a mission to fulfill. And that passion that we're, we're talking about here is, is something that we cannot manufacture on our own. It's not something that we can muster up. It's not positive thinking. It's not just self-help or it, that we're talking about here. We're talking about a destiny that is within every believer that's making its way out. It's there because God is there. If, you're committed, if you've committed your life to Christ, the Bible says that he is resident by his Holy Spirit within you. You are now a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. That's the reality for us as believers. And so you've been given a new heart and this new heart now contains God's DNA. Think about this. I mean, this blows my mind that the Lord would regenerate us, that the Lord would at that time of salvation, at that moment that we are justified in the courtroom of heaven, that, that he gives us a new heart. We become new creations, new creatures. The old person's gone. The new has come. It already knows. This new heart already knows how to beat fast for the things that makes God's heart beat fast. Do you realize that this morning? And, and so, you know, it... The, the problem isn't um, that, that we, you know, we have a heart issue. The problem is, is that we have to learn how to allow this new heart to beat more fully in each of our lives. Because the passion to serve God and do great exploits for him is already within every believer. That's part of the deal. It comes with your salvation, God's plan for your life, his purpose, his power to complete and accomplish that plan. And so the challenge for us now is to learn how to live from our new heart. And, and if you think back to when you first got saved, when you made that commitment to Christ and you received his free gift of salvation, you could feel your heart beating inside of you. I mean, 
you, you, just, you just followed instinctively that, that heartbeat that he placed within you. And so you found yourself just witnessing to people, sharing what Christ has just done in your life. You found yourself, you know, reading his word into the evening. You, you found yourself, you know, praying and talking to him and just, just having a desire to grow in this this new relationship with Christ. Everything's new. It's exciting. This new heart led you to adventure after adventure. And then oftentimes in the life of the believer, you know, those late nights with Jesus don't happen as often. And the witnessing that used to just be a part of who we were you know it doesn't happen as often and and I, I'm not sure I think about these things I look at my own life and I, I think you know what's going on one thing I know for sure it's not a heart problem because God didn't take back the new heart that he gave you at salvation and so it's it's not a heart problem I mean, we we have a regenerate heart. It still contains his DNA. If we're a believer today, it still has the great capacity for passion and exploits. So why do so many Christians lose their passion for the Lord? Well, I think one of the primary things, and maybe it might surprise us a little bit, uh, is religion. Paul teaches us in, in Romans, if, um, if you want to review the message this morning, um, Romans 6, 7, and 8 are the primary passages that I'm just kind of speaking to you from. And Romans 8 tells us, and you guys know, it tells us that we need to live and walk in the Spirit. That there's life in the Spirit. There's liberty in the Spirit for the believer. That's where freedom is. That's where the adventure lies. That's where the life of passion that God desires for every believer to, to come from. is life in the Spirit. But there are two primary obstacles to living in the Spirit like that. And we find the first in Romans chapter 6. And of course, Romans chapter 6 deals with sin. And, and so... If you choose to live according to the flesh, according to the sinful nature, according to Romans chapter 6, we will not experience all that God has for us if we choose to walk and live in the Spirit. Okay, so why didn't you say that sin is the primary obstacle? Well, because any true Christian knows that already. I mean, if... If you're a believer this morning, you know that if you're involved in willful known sin, that that affects your relationship, your communion with God. And so it's tough to pray. It's tough to be intimate with God when you're living in known disobedience. So Romans 6 teaches us, you know, that, that we're dead to sin. That's our reality as Christians. We are dead to sin and we are alive to God. Our sin has already been dealt with on the cross. In fact, verse 6 of Romans 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Do you remember that, that feeling of, of being forgiven? <laughs> I, I don't know what your story is and all of us have a you know a story before Christ and and you know depending on what was going on in your life and your life experience uh, I mean regardless to to be forgiven to know that your sins have been cleansed by by God by his grace his mercy to to have that kind of peace that when you go to bed at night and you lay your head on the pillow and you know that if you were to, to pass in your sleep that you would see Jesus, that you would be with him in heaven forever because of his grace, because of his mercy to forgive a sinner like me. And I mean, that's a, that's a whole message in itself, an endless message in itself that, that we get to live because he chose to die. 
See, God wants us to live constantly with that attitude of gratitude for what he did on the cross for us. And when we first experienced his forgiveness, wow, I, I, I mean, we, we were so grateful to understand that not only have we died with him, but verse 5 says that we have also been united with him in his resurrection. And, and so when we live from this new heart that God has placed within us, it's quick to run toward God and, not, and, and to run away from sin. When we choose not to live from this new heart, then that's when we can get off track. That's when we can get entangled in that web of sin. And when that happens, and we all know, because you know what? Light starts to be drained from our eyes. Passion starts to wane from our hearts. You know, the people say the eyes are the window to the soul. There's, there's a lot of truth to that. Because when you're living from your heart, when you're living in the spirit and you have that, that passion that's beating, there is something. I mean, Christ was so magnetic because of that light, that passion. Everywhere he went, people were attracted to him. Well, that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells in us. And, and so when we're walking in that spirit, people should be attracted to us to that light that's in us. And, but we can lose that light. We can lose that passion if we choose to, to, to live in that sinful nature, do things that we know we shouldn't be doing. And, and we know that's going to affect our fellowship with God. Satan knows that. We know that. And, and, and so if he can't tap into our passion, if he can't wane that and drain that from us by making us do bad things, well then he uses the next obstacle and he gets the same results, pretty much the same results, and that's religion. And that's where we move into Romans chapter 7. And that's where Paul teaches us about the law. Now what is the law for us today as New Testament believers? Paul basically says that anything that we do on our own, in our own strength, to try to somehow earn God's approval, that is, means we're operating under the law. That's what he calls religion, what we call religion. Trying to do things to gain God's approval and his acceptance. Now, there's a difference that we do things, good deeds, as a result of God's grace and his, our changed heart. That's just us living out our Christian lives and doing works that glorify him. But when we start to try to do works to earn his approval, now that becomes a religion. And if you think about this, if, 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 we, if we deduce this, it's actually a very heinous thing. Because it implies, if we realize it or not, that Christ's atoning sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection, weren't sufficient. And so we feel like we need to do good works, that we need to somehow perform for God to earn his approval. So becoming independent and self-sufficient and being a self-made person is so ingrained in, in so many of us just because of our culture and just because of the way we've grown up. And, and, and so we tend to bring that into our Christian lives that we constantly strive to perform and achieve to establish an identity or a self-worth. When you're first saved, none of that matters. I, I mean, think about it. You're just so grateful that God would love you, that he would forgive you, that your primary focus is just on thanking him and just on expressing your gratitude for his grace and his goodness. And so you're just in awe of him. And, and then something oftentimes tends to happen in our lives. And, and um, instead of just focusing on Jesus and just keeping it simple with that childlike faith and, and, and living out of hearts of gratitude, we tend to kind of, 
you know, think we have to help them out a little bit. And we slip back into that old culture. And it's so easy to focus on doing things and, and religious things and, and churchy things and even going through the motions with our devotions. And, and you know what? Our, our Bible reading, become, it can become like just reading a textbook rather than a, than a love letter. Our, our prayer time can become rote instead of personal and intimate and passionate. Does anybody know? What, am I the only one that experiences these things? <laughs> I feel like we get stuck in our Christian life and just kind of go through the motions a little bit and get in autopilot. Um, we 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 become religious, and we think that that's what Christians do. <laughs> I mean, because we see it happen so often, especially the longer you're in this thing. You know, the longer you've been serving Christ, the easier it is just to kind of kind of go through the motions. I hate to say that, but maybe a, 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 an illustration um, could be with a lot of marriages. You know, when a couple, when they first get married, they're passionate. And they're, they're, they're deeply in love. And, and, and you know, they uh, are very expressive. They enjoy being with each other. And, and they communicate so well. And... They can just sit together. They always, don't always even have to be talking. And they just love spending time together. You can't keep them apart. And, and then, you know, sometimes you, you start to take that for granted. Or you start to just get used to things. And, and many marriages, unfortunately, move toward two people living individual lives. You know, just under the same roof. How's that happen? You don't intend for that to happen. You don't <laughs> sign up for that to happen. We just kind of migrate into that, that culture, going through the motions. And just the opposite should be happening. The longer you're together, the more intimate you should be. And it's the same way with our relationship with God. The longer we know Him, the more intimate, the more in love we should be with Him. What happens to that kind of passion? Why do we as humans tend to gravitate towards the security of religion? Why was Jesus constantly preaching against it and calling it out in his ministry here on this earth? And we find some sense of comfort in the familiar. Even if we're just going through the motions, those motions become familiar to us. And all the while, our new heart that has been placed within us by God himself is full of adventure. It's full of passion. It's full of life, just as Jesus promised. In fact, life and life more abundantly. But we're afraid to open that door and truly live from that place. And I'm not, I'm not sure why. I mean, I, I know it's spiritual in nature primarily, and I know that Religion has, you know, if the devil can't make us bad, he makes us busy, he makes us religious and everything else, and it's kind of gets the same difference. We're not that empowered, passionate servants of Christ that are making the kind of impact, living the kind of adventure that God has prepared for us to live. And so that's, you know, the question that I have for you this morning. What, what keeps me? What keeps me from opening up my heart more fully and allowing it to feel passion, passion for God? I want us to grapple with that today, um, wrestle with it, honestly ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, and I don't know where you are in your walk with Christ, um, but I just know from time to time I need messages like this to get me to reflect and to start to look honestly and ask the Holy Spirit, how come I don't have more passion? Because that heart that he placed within me is filled with it. It has the power to accomplish all he's called me to do. And uh, so what is hindering me? What is keeping me from not living out 
the fullest life he has for me. I just received some text messages uh, over the last couple days from a very good friend of mine. His name is Anibal. In fact, Pastor Norb is friends with him as well because he's been with me to, to Cuba to minister with Pastor Anibal, who is actually the, um, uh, he's the national mission representative uh, for the Eastern Baptist Church on, uh, on the whole island of Cuba. Incredible man of God. Um, just a, an amazing man of God. Well, he's been in Brazil lately visiting his daughter. And so he's been texting the last couple nights and, and he went out and did some street witnessing to homeless people in the night in, in a very you know, bad area of Brazil. And he just confessed in the text. He said, man, I was scared. <laughs> I mean, this is a saint. This guy is an incredible man of God. I've been in his home. We've ministered together and he just loves Jesus. Sometimes I don't even feel like I'm a Christian when I'm with people like this. And for him to confess and just say, look, this was scary for me. This was a new experience and it stretched him. And yet he, they ministered to about 20 homeless people and he shared some of the testimonies with me and he shared how exciting it was and basically how his heart enlarged. And I'm thinking, Annabelle, who's been serving Jesus for decades, he's just, he, he's a leader of leaders. He's out on the streets just being Jesus to the lost, to the homeless, to the hurting. And he just said it was intrepid, it was, it was tough. But man, Jesus showed up and some good things happened. I'm thinking, I, I'm preparing and I'm thinking, I'm reading this text saying, this guy's God, <laughs> you know, that's the answer. That's what this is about. It's just saying yes to God. Now, that might not be you in, in, under a bridge in Brazil, you know, but how about in the workplace tomorrow or with family members today around a meal or, or I don't know, just, you know, in school and what's God asking us to do that maybe we haven't been saying yes to as much as, as we used to or should be. Your new heart has all the capacity it needs to beat fast and to beat very passionately for God. And so the question for us today is, you know, what's restricting it? And I'm not saying that it is being restricted. If, if it is, uh, you know, m maybe you're extremely excited about your adventure and right now with the Lord and praise God for that. That's the goal here. But all of us from time to time need some encouragement. We just need to evaluate. Have we allowed religious activity just going through the Christian motions to replace our love affair, our love relationship with Jesus Christ? Have, have we done that? Is there a sin that needs to be confessed? Is there a relationship that needs to be restored? Maybe we just need to kind of lay our hearts bare before the Lord. The Bible says that we need to examine ourselves. You know, from time to time, let's examine ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to expose anything that might hinder our fellowship with God so that we can get that right with Him. And just, just some thoughts this morning. I'd like you to stand with me, please, and I, I want to have a prayer with you. I hope that as I kind of ramble through <laughs> some of the scriptures and, and uh, things that go on in my head, and I hope that in some way, somehow, the Lord can use it to challenge you, encourage you, and, um, and, and to help you. Listen, I'm a, I'm a missionary, and this sermon's for me. Uh, you know, I need more passion I need a more sensitive heart. I need my heart to be enlarged by the Holy Spirit. And so maybe I'm primarily preaching to myself today. And if I'm the only one that goes home with something, I'll be happy with that. Let's bow our heads for a moment and just allow the Holy Spirit to, to speak to us as individuals. And I always like to just allow an opportunity to... 
to allow the Holy Spirit to accomplish what he wants. And so in this quiet time, I want you to lay aside all distractions. And I want you to listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to speak into your heart right now. you ask him he will reveal to you things that um, maybe you need to do a little bit better maybe some things that need to be removed whatever God's asking he'll speak to you you know how to hear his voice I know the word speaks very clearly to us about several things that's in the heart of God. And first of all, that he, he wants all to come to repentance. He doesn't want any to perish, Second Peter tells us. I also know that in Acts 1.8, that he tells us that a spirit-led heart has the power to be his witness. And I also know that when we get to the end of the book that this whole thing is all about Revelation 7-9 with that great multitude of, of saints gathered from all nations, every tongue, every language, every tribe, worshiping him in his throne, worshiping our God. So I know that God, the word explains very clearly that our God is a missionary God. And he placed that same heart in every believer. So Father, this morning we, um, we submit ourselves to you. And God, you tell us to do that on a regular basis just to just to yield ourselves anew and afresh and to acknowledge our need of you and to give you glory and honor for your your work Lord Jesus that enables us to even have this relationship we didn't even know we were sinners until by your spirit you revealed that to us and you're the one who called us to yourself out of your grace and your mercy and gave us the ability to even respond to that. So it's all about you. We acknowledge that. And Lord, forgive us for trying to do things on our own so often. It's just, God, it's just so easy for us to try to help you out with stuff. And, and we, we like our, our systems and and our routines and there's some kind of comfort in those things for us and change is often hard and and sometimes you're you're asking us to change and and to allow our hearts to be enlarged and sometimes that's uncomfortable for us and we resist that and um, we need your help with that Jesus to serve you better we need your help that you would help our hearts to beat faster for the things that your heart beats fast with. To, to have that light in our eyes that is so attractive, that is so magnetic, that, that draws lost people to you. 
God, give us that broken heart for the lost and for the dying. And I know there are places in this world that it's difficult for us to pray for and have a burden for because we're just so far removed from them. But yet, your heart breaks for them. And you've asked us to to be concerned as well. And we don't know how to do that fully or sometimes even very well. And so we need you, Holy Spirit. Direct our prayer times. Help the word to come to life to us as we grow in our faith. Lord, I, I just pray, uh, Lord, as a congregation here, uh, even collectively, that the water table would continue to rise for evangelism and mission and and just that more and more new names are going to be put into the Lamb's book of life as a result of not only each of us as individual Christ followers, but being parts of the body of Christ and collectively just just uh, seeing neat things happen for your kingdom. And so I pray that over this congregation and I thank you for them. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.